Uh, it's a pleasure to be here in Agra after 20 years and um, um, it's also a great uh, honor for me to be here and uh, learn about uh, nano computing and soft computing and quantum computing and understand the difference uh, because I thought all of those things were you know, somehow the same before I came here. Um, but um, what I'm going to talk about today is uh, kind of tangential, but uh, it could be one of the holy grails uh, uh, in terms of realizing the full potential of the different paradigms of the novel computing uh, techniques that has been discussed in the last couple of days. So in my group, basically what we do is we make nanoscale structures of various different materials. Uh, could be semiconductors, could be metals, could be insulators. And we control the properties by placing atoms in configurations that we can control or we can direct. And we want to use these nanoscale building blocks. Um, you, you want to use them as building blocks to make larger scale architectures. And those would be, of course, building blocks for devices in a chip. So <clears throat> in order to uh, uh, actually give you a perspective, and from what I understand, most of the uh, computing uh, uh, paradigms discussed here are used uh, as simulation tools or modeling tools to uh, model problems or solve uh, computational problems. But what we do here in, in my group uh, could uh, uh, give you perspectives on what are the real challenges to make devices that use uh, these kinds of uh, um, uh, you know, computational paradigms at the chip level itself. Before I say anything, I just want to thank my, acknowledge my students and postdocs who did the actual work that I'm going to present today. I can't, uh, I don't have enough time to thank uh, all of them, but um, uh, you know, I have uh, students, um, uh, Saurabh Agrawal, Darshan Gandhi, Arup, Chingyu Yan, uh, currently, and several others who are working uh, uh, around the world right now, and uh, collaborators also who are from various different parts of the world. Uh, Rajit Bose, uh, Moshe Eisenberg, uh, Ivan Petrov, Kim Turner, Klaus Kern, and others. And I'm, of course, eternally grateful for funding from various different agencies, without which with, uh, with this work that I'm going to present would not have been possible. OK, so we make building blocks. And uh, the idea of making nanoscale building blocks is to harness the novel properties that you can get by quantum confinement or dimensional confinement. All right, And I will talk. Um, broadly speaking, uh, three or four different kinds of examples which are relevant to making devices or nano devices, no matter what the uh, computational paradigm is. And uh, first I will talk about uh, how we can actually organize carbon nanotubes, uh, which could be used as a single electron transistor if you want to, uh, or you could use them as interconnects between devices uh, which are in nanoscopic in dimensions. And I'll talk about how we can organize them in various different configurations on a planar surface. And I'll also talk about certain scaling issues involved in uh, obtaining uh, architectures that would be useful for making devices. I mean, it's all very nice if I, you know, by making a single electron transistor, uh, one, you know, one of those. You know, it takes, takes a great effort to do that. But in order to use that for computing, you need to be able to make maybe a zillion, a million of those. or billion of those on a chip. And uh, how do we do this? Or can we do it? Um, those are the kind of questions that I'm going to answer. I'm going to uh, address, ask and answer some of those, and also highlight some of the challenges involved in various different material systems. And uh, I will talk also about how we can use carbon nanotubes or other one-dimensional nanostructures, you know, wired-like nanostructures, and uh, use them as architectures uh, wherein you can decorate them with other nanostructures like nanoparticles, amino acids, or proteins, which can, uh, you know, change uh, a, a bond, you know, chemically, or which can be addressed uh, by uh, by light and other means for as a means of uh, creating device elements used for computation. And then I will talk about a couple of uh, examples wherein we can make nanoparticles. Where here, you know, you can see that the shape is uh, nearly spherical, and how we can use them as building blocks to make two-dimensional assemblies or arrays of, um, uh, you know, or thin films of these nanostructures, or even chains of these nanostructures, and uh, use them to uh, create architectures that you may want to explore certain kinds of uh, um, uh, computing uh, paradigms. 
We can I'll also show you some pretty pictures of how we can, you know, really do origami at the nanoscale to be able to, you know, uh, get branched nanostructures of various different shapes that you can control, you can control uh, in a predetermined way. Finally, I will show you a very remarkable example of, um, you know, how we can use self-assembled molecular layers to actually isolate disparate materials, which is going to be very critical because if you're going to make nano devices, of course, you're going to probably have insulators, metals, semiconductors, and all those, and you want to make sure that they don't mix together, okay, because they need to uh, uh, be stable. So isolating uh, while maintaining the structural integrity of these structures is very important, and I'll talk about that a little bit before I conclude my talk. Okay, let's talk about carbon nanotubes. I mean, for um, let's just say that you know these are um, one-dimensional structures or wire-like or molecular structures which have very nice electrical properties. Okay, and uh, you can have ballistic electron transport, and depending upon the actual crystal structure or the chirality of the tubes, you can, they can be semiconducting or metallic, and you can think about various different kinds of quantum devices you can make. As I said, if I want to make a real chip, I need to be able to uh, assemble not one nanotube, but more like maybe 10 million or a billion nanotubes on a, a planar surface and should be able to do this in a repeatable and a manufacturable, manufacturable fashion. So in order to do that, what are the key things that one needs to do? Well, I need to be able to control where the nanotubes nucleate, where, in which directions they grow, if you can make welds, and junctions, and all this without compromising the quantum properties or the electronic and mechanical properties of the carbon nanotubes. Now, the good news is actually uh, we can achieve almost all of these features. The bad news is not yet at single carbon nanotube level because there are some serious physical scaling issues involved. Okay, and I'll uh, uh, mention those uh, in a few minutes. So here we, you know, resort to chemistry. And uh, where you know nature does most of the, most of the work, and we just have to get lucky by trying the right kind of things. And uh, we use a, a precursor where we have a carbon source and a, and a catalyst, which is delivered from the gas phase. And the iron actually selectively this this catalyst selectively interacts with silica SiO2, and uh, in exclusion to silicon, and produces growth of carbon nanotubes only on silica. And um, there are two very remarkable things that happen for this particular chemistry. Um, this is a scanning electron micrograph. The white regions are the regions where carbon nanotubes have grown um, selectively on silica. The black regions are silicon, where there is no growth at all. Okay? And that is the first feature. So growth on silica, no growth on silic uh, silicon. And wherever you have the carbon nanotube growth, the nanotubes grow vertically. Okay, it's normal to the surface of the silica. So these are the two remarkable features, and I'll, you'll know why in just a moment. So this is just to, you know, if you put this in, a, look this in a, with your eye, you put a piece of silicon, nothing happens into the CVD chamber. If you put, in, if you put a piece of silica, then it blackens. Okay, so um, I have, using just these two features, what I can do is I can use lithography, and I can put. Uh, I can make you know, disks of uh, silica on silicon, and I can grow, and I would expect to get structures like this, and indeed, I get these wonderful you know, pillar-like structures, which actually cons consists of clusters of carbon nanotubes. So this, this is pretty good, you know, you can, that means we can assemble bundles of carbon nanotubes. Good first step. And these are all unidirectional structures. This can be actually done by other uh, methods also. Uh, which, you know, for example, put down a catalyst, pattern it, and then um, uh, do the uh, growth. But here the beauty is catalyst, uh, I mean, uh, you just put the silica disks and catalysts and the uh, precursor, everything comes from the gas phase. So all the design comes before the actual you know growth occurs so it's very powerful now the, you can also make these inverse structures by just inverting lithography you can see uh, you can make these porous structures which could be used for plasmonics uh, if you want and uh, you can actually control the sizes of these pores and you can uh, the shapes and so forth and also can be used for a variety of applications in um, uh, biology or, or membrane separation and so forth the true power of this particular method of growth is that Suppose I, uh, you know, provide enough surface area on the side as well. Now I can actually get two-dimensional growth, okay? And actually by extension, I can get multi-directional growth by just chiseling the silica surfaces, 
um, and uh, because this, the carbon nanotubes inherit the topography of the silica. All right? And if you had noticed earlier, you see there's no growth laterally. And that's actually quite an important point which I'll touch upon later. Okay, so um, here I'm just providing a solution. So I provide more uh, surface area and I'll get growth like this. So these are cartoons. Let me show you some real example. And these are unprecedented and um, uh, these have not been repeated by any other technique. Of course, we can repeat it by using this technique. I mean, um, what we've done is, so you have silica, it has enough surface area here and here. You have carbon nanotubes growing in two different directions all at once in a single process. Okay, so that is a very good step. Additionally, suppose I chisel the silica at an oblique angle, you know, I can get oblique structures. I can do, you know, I can get uh, all possible in-plane orientations if I do this in a circle, and the possibilities are endless. And the beauty about this is it's completely scalable. You can do this on a 12-inch wafer if you want. And uh, you can see that over here, you know, this, uh, the dimensions are in hundreds of microns. So you can see that nanotubes have grown very beautifully in, you know, throughout the wafer. We have done it for about two inches. That's the size of the furnace. So, but this, this is very scalable and manufacturable. And as I said, now I can make all, you know, all uh, different kinds of shapes of silica to get complex architectures. I can make men's structures. I can make, make uh, you know, like uh, microfluidic structures and also very pretty structures like this, which may not be useful for anything much other than aesthetics. All right. <clears throat> In addition to doing all this, we can also, um, I mean, to make devices, you need to be able to also suppress growth where you don't want it, okay? And uh, we have a few methods of doing that. One is basically cover up the silica surfaces with a non-catalytic material, and uh, by playing, uh, you know, tricks with, uh, shadowing tricks, essentially, you can uh, restrict the growth to just three phases, or two phases, or just one phase. Okay, and um, the idea is basically the gold in this particular case covers the rest of the areas and you get, get no growth. Additionally, you can also notice that by putting different amounts of gold on different faces, you can also control the length because in a device structure, obviously, you don't make devices with all the same length of the elements. You need different elements with precise control. Okay, uh, there is another very uh, interesting way in which you can control the lengths of carbon nanotubes, and that is very non-intuitive. I'm going to very briefly touch upon this. Um, you can see that this is the length of the carbon nanotube, and this is the silica thickness. So the thickness of the silica under layer actually plays an important role. So below a critical thickness, you actually get no growth, which is not surprising because that's, you know, we, get, we do get selectivity, and that's what this shows. But actually, if you want to, let's say, get two different lengths, of carbon nanotubes, all that you need to do is you can also just use two different silica um, uh, layers with different thicknesses. I won't go into details about why uh, this happens, um, but you know if you're interested, you can ask me during the Q and A question, you know, a session. Okay, so I said that. Uh, well, if you had looked at the pictures, you know these are all in microns. Bundles are microns, all right. But the carbon nanotubes themselves are nanostructures, all right. And uh, ultimately, we are interested in making um, devices with individual nanotubes, you know, in various different uh, organizations. So I showed you earlier that you didn't have any growth laterally when you had, you know, very thin disks. And so we wanted to explore why. So what we did was we took a bunch of silica particles of different sizes to see if there is a substrate size dependence in terms of getting the carbon nanotube growth. And we find that indeed uh, there is. Here you can see that the growth, uh, the carbon nanotube bundles actually grow on the particles of uh, silica uh, and also, you know, in fact, inherit the shape of uh, the assembly of the silica particles. You can get walls of uh, the carbon nanotubes or you can get also two-dimensional assemblies like this without any problem. In cases where you have in, uh, isolated particles, you actually get, you know, the carbon nanotubes growing, uh, they fall down as opposed to being reinforced together. It's like, you know, soldiers all standing close together and uh, reinforcing each other. Uh, you know, even if you have weak one in between, you, you wouldn't be able to tell, you know, he or she would be uh, basically uh, held together by the neighbors, by Van der Waals interactions, actually. Okay, but what happens is when you decrease the size of the silica particles, what happens is this, uh, these carbon nanotubes, they are not reinforced by each other anymore, and they uh, behave like polymeric structures. That's because, you know, as you decrease the particle size, see, the nanotubes tend to grow with a greater angular separation, and hence they do not have the scope to reinforce each other and get directionality. So entropy takes over, 
as opposed to enthalpy and if you uh, thermodynamically speaking and hence these curl up and uh, the nucleation also decreases as you uh, decrease the size of the particles further and you all that you get is amorphous carbon but uh, um, and that is actually captured in this particular picture uh, nicely this is the Raman uh, intensity of the D and G band D represents uh, disordered carbon G represents graphitic carbon which comprise, uh, comprises uh, carbon nanotubes and this as you decrease silica, silica sphere diameter you can see that the, uh, the the disordered part really shoots up okay and you don't get carbon nanotubes anymore so this is actually a serious scaling issue I mean if I want to align nanotubes at least by this method okay um, and in the in the configurations that I want um, it's still a very, very open question. I mean, we can make very nice nanotubes um, uh, and also align structures, but not of single um, uh, elements as yet. <clears throat> um, other good news, of course, is that we can actually grow these structures on almost any oxide. I showed you on silica, but we can do this on hafnia, you can do this on indium tin oxide, you can do on a variety of different oxides. Because, um, I mean, that's very useful uh, uh, for uh, device applications. Let's say you want to access electrical and optical properties of such structures. Let me show you a couple of uh, uh, results on the, uh, some of the interesting electrical properties of these bundles. Suppose I have bundles like this and I have, uh, you know, like two terminals. What happens is initially at low voltages I get ohmic behavior. This is a differential conduction, conductance and this is actually the, I, um, the current versus voltage plot. So it's ohmic for low voltages, but at high voltages, actually you get superlinear behavior, or you have more current actually flowing through than Ohm's law would allow. And uh, the reason for this, we have figured out by a variety of different uh, experiments and also density functional theory calculations, that uh, the conductivity in this particular case is thermally activated, and that is not surprising. These carbon nanotubes are semi-metallic, and uh, the interesting thing though is when you increase the uh, electric field across the terminals, the activation energy actually decreases. All right, so that's shown over here. Activation energy is, uh, is uh, decreasing as a function of the uh, electric field in a pull frankel kind of behavior. What that uh, amounts to is there are additional channels of uh, or additional additional pathways for the carriers to go through the carbon nanotubes. Okay, and. Um, uh, these could be used for, um, you know, for interconnects uh, much more efficiently than, for example, nanotube with just one shell as opposed to multiple shells. Okay, <clears throat> I want to switch gears and talk a little bit about how we can make hybrid structures using carbon nanotubes. Okay, and you can make, put quantum dots on carbon nanotubes and use the coupling uh, uh, for, to, to think about making new kinds of devices and to, for, to explore new kinds of uh, computing paradigms. Um, one of the things is carbon nanotubes are very, very stable. They're very happy structures, very strong bonds, bonding. Now, in order to interface those with other materials, hence, is difficult. So the typical strategy that is undertaken is take this, beat the hell out of it in an acid, and then hope that you know, bonds are broken, then attach other things to it. Um, the, it works, you know, as you can see here, gold nanoparticles decorating the carbon nanotubes, but you have no control over where this happens. So in order to make a device, you want to be able to do things precisely. So we explored a few different uh, approaches. One of them is uh, by using uh, kilo electron volt ions. Uh, you uh, use them to actually break bonds, okay? And use this, uh, uh, you don't not only get spatial resolution by uh, uh, controlling the size of the ion beam, but also you can do this in a controllable fashion in terms of how much damage you uh, create as opposed to destroying the tube, which can happen when you put it in an acid. And after that, you can put, use mild uh, chemical treatments to then attach this with molecules or other structures. So just as an example, you know, you can create structures like this, where you have a carbon nanotube like this, and you have this, uh, um, you know, nanoparticle or a protein, which is electroactive. I'll show you one example where this attaches onto this, uh, and uh, you can now uh, manipulate the IV characteristics of the carbon nanotubes by perturbing this. So you can use this as a switch, perhaps. Okay, and uh, I'm sure you'd probably be able to think about other kinds of uh, uh, ways in which you can use this as for computing. But this is the basic idea over here. And here, for example, this could be a you know a, a biological you know analyte. Um, uh, this could be a, a chip that could uh, um, recognize um, uh, certain biological molecules when you have an analyte because of its interactions with, with these various different elements, which are uh, different proteins, for example.
Okay, so now you have, um, I'm breaking bonds with ions, okay, and then I'm exposing it to air. This is just one simple example. You can see this is actually the infrared spectrum. When I have irradiation, I can see all these carboxyl groups, allyl groups, and other moieties that show up, but when I have pristine nanotubes, nothing much happens. So, by what this says is, only in places where I hit them with ions, I'm able to functionalize. So, I get site selectivity along the segments of the carbon nanotubes. And this is Raman spectra, which shows that, you know, the D band increases, which means that I'm actually indeed creating defects. So, no surprises here, but this is actually uh, uh, the first time demonstration of selective um, uh, functionalization of uh, segments of carbon nanotubes. Okay, and uh, we can do various different kinds of chemistries here, you know, for example, use the carboxyl group and attach uh, gold nanoparticles, and you can see that only the irradiated regions have the gold nanoparticles and others don't, all right. We can do this for um, fluorescent nanospheres or microspheres, and you can do this for various different materials, and you can see that um, the length scales are very well controlled, and also you can control the shapes um, of the, you know, like, um, uh, or the location where the nanoparticles basically attach. Now, let me show you an example which could be relevant to uh, biocomputing or, um, I, well, it, I don't know, just, or it could be biosensing depending upon how you uh, implement it. Suppose I use an electroactive protein, okay, this is actually azurin, it has a very high dipole moment and um, uh, in this particular case, we attach this by electrostatic interactions to certain segments of carbon nanotubes and I will show you that when we did Raman spectroscopy, what we found was that pristine azurin shows this particular signature with certain kind of coordination or basically certain kind of shape, okay, so and which you can relate that to a certain kind of dipole moment. Now, if I have that attached to carbon nanotubes, you see a different signature, okay, and uh, what that means is uh, it, it is, uh, its structure is distorted and hence its dipole moment is also distorted. Now, the IV characteristics of the carbon nanotubes should be modified, you know, or should be distinguishable in these two cases. The additional thing is, suppose I have this kind of a configuration and I use an external stimulus, maybe, a, you know, some kind of biological molecule that interacts with azurin, then I can actually modulate the um, characteristics over here, which can be used for some kind of recognition, computing. Um, I don't know if it can be used for more than binary, but definitely it can be used for binary. Uh, uh, kind of operations. Now, just to show you that this is indeed you can do this, uh, you can see that the azurin um, derivatized nanotubes show the IV characteristics that are like this, functionalized tubes show these, and uh, suppose I expose them to thermal um, stresses, then the hybrids actually show an irreversible behavior, while the functionalized tubes show a re reversible behavior. So, um, uh, you know, I can see that the changes in the conductance are actually quite large. Okay, so you can use this as different states uh, if you can design architectures appropriately. Okay, I told you that, uh, you know, um, we, were, we wanted to do uh, modified nanotubes in a mild way rather than in a very um, uh, haphazard or in a very aggressive way, but we need to be careful and just wanted to show about what ion beams can do. You can see that they can cut the nanotubes uh, or, you know, they can um, um, thin them or do nothing to them depending upon what the diameter is. In addition, you can also weld them. Here are two proximal nanotubes, and you can see that they are welded over here, all right? And you have multiple welds over here. So it can be uh, also, your ion beams can also be used as a tool to create networks, okay, of these nanostructures, and, um, uh, you know, that would be useful for uh, creating architectures. Okay, what does it do to the electrical properties when I just, you know, hit nanotubes with ions? You can see that you know, here, this is actually a transmission electron micrograph showing the uh, basal planes or, um, of uh, graphite or of the graphene sheets that are folded of the nanotubes. When I um, bombard them with ions, you can see that there is uh, uh, defect creation and reconstruction. The shapes are changing. This is the atomic scale structure. And in this particular case, when we have very high doses, it is not a tube anymore. You can see the hollow in all these cases, but in this case, there's no hollow and so it actually becomes a nano rod. So, what happens to the electrical properties? Well, you can see over here that when I have before radiation, the resistance versus temperature behavior uh, has this activation energy of around 200 milli electron volts, semi-metallic basically, but after radiation, it, it changes a little bit, but the thing is you can controllably do this, okay, as opposed to destroying the nanotube, which we do in, uh, when you uh, use acid treatments. 
There are other simpler ways of doing uh, the same kind of things that I showed you here. For example, I, if I put networks of nanotubes, if I put a mat of nanotubes and you know this way and this way, and I want to create wells, I could just do that by passing high currents. And um, this movie actually shows you an, a very preliminary experiment where actually you see some sparks. So let me, now that you've seen the sparks, let me tell you what's going on really. You just spread out some carbon nanotubes you know, with four terminals and pass current. And um, this, this arcing occurs because of, uh, you know, like uh, basically um, um, uh, carriers jumping across the, the, the overlapping nanotubes. And if you look at the, the changes that are happening, the changes are very similar to what, you, what I showed you in, carbon nano, in ion bombardment case. You know, you get cutting and thinning of carbon nanotubes. You get also cladding or welding of tubes and so forth. And this you can do it, of course, uh, you know, in a very uh, cheap way. And um, the very interesting thing here, though, is once, you're ha once you have these mats of nanotubes and you're actually passing high currents and you're creating sparks and you're breaking nanotubes and so forth, you would expect that the conductance will actually go down. Correct? But what happens initially is the conductance goes up in uh, short time frames. And the reason for that is, as you, even as you're creating defects, you're also creating more number of pathways for the current to be carried, carried uh, through in this network. Okay, let me show you a different strategy of derivatizing nanotubes with other kind of quantum structures. I'll show you two examples. And here the emphasis is on creating large quantities of these hybrid structures as opposed to organizing them. And uh, the approach that we took was uh, use uh, microwaves, all right? And uh, here we take nanotubes and we also take metal ions um, and uh, just microwave it. And uh, by re reducing the metal ions, we get uh, uh, you know, either metallic uh, nanoparticles or semiconducting nanoparticles, depending on what chemistry you use. And you also functionalize the tubes because of interaction with the microwave and the water um, and the carbon nanotubes. <clears throat> you can see over here, you're creating defects all right. The D-band goes up, so defects are created. And in addition, addition you're seeing that the uh, CC uh, allyl bonds and uh, carboxyl bonds are evolving as you increase the microwave exposure. The beauty is that all this happens in a minute or two. Okay, you just take nanotubes, you put the metal, you know, metal salt solution, put it in a microwave, simple microwave, turn it on, this is what happens. If you were to do, the, do this otherwise, by conventional routes, it'll take you about a day to do this, and also you have, you have uh, you'll be destroying the tubes and their properties. So this is actually a very neat and nifty way of uh, manufacturing these hybrid structures, which can be uh, used as building blocks again for various different architectures. Here is another example, just by varying the chemistry, um, we can do you know, copper oxide or uh, cadmium sulfide or any of the semiconductor quantum dots and with controllable shapes on these other skeletons or skeletal networks of carbon nanotubes. So, I mean, there are various different uh, routes in which you can actually create this kind of hybrid structures and also organize them uh, by using these one-dimensional structures. I want to shift gears again at this point to talk a little bit about storage. That is, you know, like uh, information storage, because I did hear there are, um, in, in uh, quantum computing, you can have different kinds of paradigms where, you know, you use uh, storage, uh, heavy uh, algorithms and otherwise. Um, that's the extent. Uh, or that I understood, but uh, uh, here the idea, our motivation for doing this was to create uh, high density data storage, okay, where you use each nanoparticle as a bit, okay. Um, so this is actually a very pretty picture. You can see that uh, these are nanoparticles of iron platinum, okay, which are supposed to be magnetic, but uh, in this particular case they are not, well, or they are magnetic, all right, but they, they have very low coercivity, okay. and. Uh, uh, so uh, ideally, for, to, for this to store the data, what you would need is high coercivity, so that you know the, the spin stays put the way you, where you write it. So um, you'd like the combination of this and this. Right? But what uh, was shown is, when you make these nanoparticles, because of the size, uh, these are superparamagnetic, which means that the spins are actually, they, they fluctuate because of the phase um, uh, of the nanoparticles. So in order to get the high coercivity phase, you need to anneal them, you need to heat them up. Once you heat them up, you get high coercivity, all right, but you're destroying the nanostructures. So the challenge, one of the challenges here is to make really small particles that have high coercivity that can hold the spin and retain the shape too. And they need to be stable to thermal, you know, chemical and all other kinds of uh, stimuli. 
So we did a couple, we took a couple of approaches, one not very successful and one extremely successful. I want to just share with you both of those. I won't bother with you with the details of the chemistry here. Just want to say that, you know, we take platinum and iron and we just put this additional uh, element, antimony. The idea was uh, to get the ordering or get the crystal structure um, uh, that gives the high coercivity phase at a lower temperature. So that, you know, we don't go to high temperatures which would uh, destroy the architecture. So when I plot the coercivity as a function of annealing temperature, let's look at the green uh, cartoon that I've drawn over here. You need to go to about 500 degrees centigrade in order to get the high coercivity phase. Okay, by the time you're destroying your assembly, so it's useless. Now, by adding this antimony, the idea is antimony is a big atom, so you know it, it uh, and it also doesn't like to stay in the lattice of iron and platinum, so it likes to go out. The moment you heat that a little bit, it's, it's going to shuffle the other atoms, and hopefully that will drive it to the uh, high coercivity phase. That is the idea, and indeed it does. As you can see, you know, at about 250 degrees centigrade, you start to get the high coercivity values. <laughs> but the problem is that since you are increasing the mobility, let's look at just this graph over here. The uh, particles uh, also start to coerce, uh, coarsen. Okay, so we have we end up with the same problem. So we said, okay, let's take a completely different approach. Let's try to solve many problems at once. You know, we, we, we became more ambitious actually after failure. And um, in, in fact, uh, as you will see, this is uh, quite a remarkable, um, uh, you know, like uh, approach that I'm going to talk about. What we do is we take, uh, na uh, we use droplets of water, okay, nano droplets of water. These are micro emulsions for those of you uh, who know chemistry. Uh, basically, uh, we uh, reduce iron and platinum in this confined environment, make the nanoparticle iron and platinum. Okay, these are still super paramagnetic, so these, these are not high coerci coercivity. But the, one, one additional thing that we do is we coat it with a very thin shell of silica, so that if I want, I can heat this composite up and I'll be able to change the crystal structure inside but I want to, uh, by pre I will still be able to preserve the overall shape of the particle. Okay, that is the overall idea. And additionally, I can also functionalize the surface with the molecules and hence, you know, uh, disperse it in other matrices and biological systems or uh, help it to assemble and get these kinds of structures. This cartoon, this is a cartoon of course and uh, this is actually realized and I'll show you the various aspects of it in the next few minutes. You can see we can control the particle size very beautifully. And uh, none of this is optimized here. We can optimize it and get really uh, great pictures. But the point over here is that you can control the particle size. And um, you know, just by uh, adjusting the uh, water droplet size by simple microemulsion chemistry. And once you have this thin silica shell, you know, in the as prepared form, it looks like this. And once you anneal it, you see that it's still, you know, they don't coalesce. They are not agglomerated. I mean, they're they are kind of sticking to each other, and I'll tell you why in a moment, but the point is there's no change in the particle size. That's quite important. So we have solved the problem of, you know, change in the shape. That's good. But the assembly still looks very bad, and the reason for that is because silica, you have this OH group sticking out, and those tend to form hydrogen bonds. So you need to functionalize the surface, so we put in a molecule, and once you put the molecule, you can see you get a much better assembly. And once you heat it up, you actually destroy the assembly, but the but I mean you can reassemble them of course and uh, by you know redispersing and so forth. The beauty here is you have for the first time after annealing nanoparticles that are high coercivity and in the nanoparticle shape you know where the assembly is not where the shape is not destroyed. And that is seen over here. You can see that you get the high coercivity shown by the blue coercivity curve when the red one you know there is uh, uh, which is the as prepared case it's super paramagnetic. Okay, we can use these building blocks to also, you know, string them together into nano chains. Um, you know, if this could be useful for some kind of, uh, you can use these to, to make, um, uh, let's say, you know, like complex structures, like um, of different shapes to to, uh, to explore different architectures. The idea here is uh, quite simple. You know, we can make particles, and we use two different kinds of uh, uh, braiding molecular braiding agents where we can actually make uh, uh, chains not only of controllable length, we can control them very precisely, but also of controllable diameters. All right? And um, um, this is just to show that we can do this for various different materials. And, uh, you know, and this we have explored mostly magnetic materials. And uh, this could be something that could be uh, uh, used, useful for uh, you know, um, 
dilute magnets, you know, for various uh, spintronic applications. Okay, one of the big challenges in uh, nano computing uh, device architectures, of course, is heat dissipation. Okay, and uh, what I hear from the experts uh, who, who do this for a living is that even if you make, let's say, if I were to make carbon nanotube device right now, okay, we somehow overcome all the scaling issues and figure out how to separate the different tubes and so forth and make a device, most likely it will just blow up, okay, in term, just because of the uh, amount of heat that is dissipated. So, we need to really think about um, uh, ways in which you can uh, get out heat and this has to be uh, new ways, obviously, because things are happening at the nano scale and it's, uh, it's very poorly understood. One of the strategies that we have taken is to work with materials, with, work with thermoelectric materials, wherein you can actually use, you can integrate that with um, interconnects and other switches so that you can use, you can, you can use the local refrigeration to uh, cool hot spots and remove heat away. I'll just show you a couple of uh, examples uh, wherein we are looking at uh, bismuth telluride and uh, here um, basically just wanted to show that we can make uh, nanostructures of bismuth telluride, I mean single crystals without um, uh, using any kind of templates, um, uh, physical templates really. And uh, the idea here is, of course, since, you know, like thermoelectrics, uh, you, uh, you want to basically get high um, electrical conductivity and you want to get low thermal conductivity, right? And the electrical conductivity you want to tune by using quantum confinement, so getting more states near the Fermi level, but the, uh, getting uh, low thermal conductivity you want to actually uh, obtained by the size confinement because of uh, uh, the phonon scattering from the surfaces and uh, you know the uh, the boundaries of the structure itself. So the nanostructures that we made actually give you um, uh, well the films of nanostructures at least give us actually very promising uh, Seebeck coefficients and also uh, uh, electrical conductivities, which we are hoping we can when when integrated with, uh, with the interconnect, interconnect structures, which in um, in, in uh, nano computer in conventional nanoelectronic uh, devices, uh, you know, this could be a way in which we can dissipate heat. Okay, we can make really, we can make uh, complex architectures of these um, as well. So, these are not unlike what you, what I showed you in the case of carbon nanotubes, but the methods used are completely different. You can see that I can uh, control the degree of branching and everything here is a single crystal, okay. And uh, these are all modulated by actually using uh, molecular uh, templating agents. And, uh, you know, this kind of control would be very, very useful to make, um, you know, like architectures where, let us say, I want to, let's say this is a hot spot, you know, I want to carry heat away from, you know, um, to various different directions. I can actually design, consider, uh, you can think about designing these kind of um, thermal conduits. I'm going to skip uh, the mechanism part of it um, because that's probably going to be um, not too relevant. The last example that I want to give actually is, uh, I think, would be relevant for any kind of uh, nano device, irrespective of uh, what uh, uh, the computing paradigm would be, um, and that is in order to isolate different materials. Okay, and of course, structural integrity needs to be preserved no matter what; it can't crumble. So, I'm going to take the simple example in the current uh, microelectronics device paradigm and also the nano uh, paradigm, wherein copper uh, integration with uh, low dielectric constant materials is a problem because copper diffuses very quickly or, uh, into the adjacent uh, layer and also it doesn't stick very well. Okay, how can we actually solve this uh, problem, um, you know, and uh, do this by using minimum amount of material? You know, this will cease to be a nano device if I need to put a micro layer in between, you know, to, to isolate it. Or even like, you know, like, a, uh, let's say this, this dimension is of the order of, let's say, 45 uh, nanometers. And um, uh, the, the diffusion barrier layer that I need to put in, if it's going to be 10 nanometers, that is a large amount. So, I'm compromising uh, the area that I'm, I need for low resistivity copper. So, ideally, I'd like to have this as, you know, like, as thin as possible. Um, uh, the, the, the diffusion barrier should be as thin as possible to uh, isolate as well as provide integrity. So, we, we tried a, you know, like completely wild idea. This is an undergraduate project actually of five years ago and uh, the amazing thing is it worked. And uh, of course, we have been exploring this, uh, various aspects of this for the last several years. The idea is instead of putting in uh, 
taking a brute force approach, which actually works quite well for micro uh, scale, but doesn't work well for nano scale. Here you put tantalum or tantalum nitride or some other material where the interaction is minimized to some, you know, like some smaller length scale, and these two stay separate and everything is fine. But as I said, that, you know, you need a critical thickness of this for this to work. So we said, let's take molecules with certain groups on top, certain groups on the bottom, and these are going to be CH, you know, CC bonds essentially, which are very happy. And this is going to create a vacuum-like potential between these two materials. So it's going to be harder for this material to jump across, okay, these atoms to jump across, because it's being bonded chemically locally here, immobilized, and the same thing is happening over here. And these molecular layers can be made very easily. It's like, you know, basically dip coating. It's like molecular beaker epitaxy. And uh, it's really a graduate student's dream. I mean, you can take these molecules if you're in, in a solution or a vapor phase, and uh, they assemble like soldiers here again, driven by thermodynamics, and uh, because of Van der Waals interactions between the molecules. And um, uh, you can choose the, you can synthesize the molecules with whichever terminal groups that you want. Okay, let me show you how it works. So we actually make metal oxide semiconductor um, um, structures to study if study the diffusion or study the transport of copper across. So when we have no molecular layer in between, you can see that the leakage current actually goes up rather quickly, and you know this uh, corresponds to the breakdown of the SiO2, and this happens at rather low t uh, low uh, times. But once I put a single molecular layer, and the thickness we are talking about the molecular layer is one nanometer, two nanometers max. Okay, you can see that the failure is postponed, and also the leakage currents are much much smaller. And uh, to give you a perspective on, you know, like how good are these compared to the uh, barriers that are used currently in devices? Um, the, again, leakage current as a function of time. You can see without any barrier, you know, the, it's pretty bad. Okay, and if I have conventional barriers of similar thicknesses, uh, you know, like of uh, these two molecular barriers. Um, what happens is uh, you, can, you can see if I have an amine terminated um, layer, I get improvement. And if I have a carboxyl terminated layer, I get really very large improvement. And in fact, it's better than uh, conventional solutions of similar thicknesses. And this is without any optimization. Okay, so this is really a truly powerful way. And uh, um, it, while, you know, of course, there are a lot of other issues to be addressed as, uh, for integration in a device, I think these kinds of uh, new approaches need to be developed to be uh, able to make new, nan new kinds of nano devices um, with, uh, uh, which uh, take advantage of uh, other things other than uh, binary computing methods. Um, I mentioned structural integrity, so I will just uh, talk about that for the next few minutes before I uh, wind up. Basically, um, you know, things need, shouldn't break. Once you're making them, they shouldn't break, right? And how do you ensure this at the nanoscale? Okay, and this is a real challenge because you have so many different kinds of materials all close together, and um, uh, you, you, want to, you want the interaction to be uh, very good or strong, but at the same time, you don't want them to mix, okay? And so we actually explored the effect of these uh, single layers as glues to see if we can hold it also in addition to uh, isolating them chemically. So we also have a technique which is actually very powerful to uh, measure the interfacial adhesion or toughness quantitatively. And the way we do this is we create a test structure like this. You know, it's a four-point bending um, test structure, and we create a notch. And once you bend it, the, 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 from the notch tip, you have a crack, crack going through, and it'll go, lateral, it'll go down to the interface, the weakest interface, and grow laterally, um, which gives rise to a load versus displacement curve that looks something like this. And this plateau corresponds to the crack going through the weakest interface across. Okay, and from that, you can actually get the toughness value quantitatively. In fact, um, very few places in the world have this uh, machine. We built it ourselves. We didn't invent this technique, and Intel actually uses this as a, a benchmark. So you have load versus displacement for a copper silica interface without anything, and the value that you get, of, and the, the, the toughness value you get, that you get is 3 joules per meter square. I'll tell you what this means in a minute. Um, and uh, once I put a molecular layer, with a sulfur group on top you know, and uh, a propyl group in between, you get 9 joules per meter squared. Again, unoptimized and have you know, tripled the toughness value. Okay? 
And uh, to tell you what these numbers mean, in an Intel chip, I don't know, in a Pentium chip, maybe it is, uh, I don't know what the latest chip is called, but typically it is uh, uh, for an interface to be st uh, considered stable in the chip, the value that you need to meet is about 5 joules per meter squared. So without optimizing, I'm using a single layer, okay, and uh, we have actually tripled the value, right? So that is not all. And uh, we know why this is happening. I'll just, I won't go into the gory details of the spectroscopy studies that we did, but let me just mention that copper and sulfur bond, okay? And uh, that bond is actually shown by spectroscopic signatures over here, and the breakage actually occurs on the silica side of the interface. Now, we wanted to study the thermal stability of uh, these uh, structures because in man manufacturing, you know, that's quite important because of the, the, these molecules would probably get fried. That's what our thought was. But remarkably, what we found was by heating up, we were actually enhancing the adhesion. And um, let's look at that. The interface toughness plotted, plot, plotted as a function of um, uh, the annealing temperature. So I showed you this data point earlier, so you get the threefold increase. But as we heat it to, let's say, 100 or 300 degrees centigrade, it actually degrades, the toughness degrades. And above 300, however, it starts to increase again. And uh, above 500, in fact, this interface is not the weakest interface anymore. Okay, failure occurs in the epoxy. So what we're getting here is actually colossal toughening. All right? So what's going on? I mean, this is totally counterintuitive because these molecules, you know, are organic molecules, and normally people study these on surfaces and these desorb, and you know, about 300, they're not even considered for any use. But this suggests that we can use these at high enough temperatures if we can use them at interfaces as opposed to surfaces. And um, let me just show you, tell you why, what's happening, and I'll just show you the modeling calculation and leave, spare you the experimental part. At low temperatures, when you anneal it, See, this part of the um, bond actually stays stable. And this part, however, you know, actually is unstable. The, the, the OH groups that you have on the, with, the, with the silicon actually tend to form SiO-Si bonds, but they revert upon cooling. Okay? So the for bonds formed here actually are reversible for less than 400 degrees centigrade. So this remains a weak link. Okay? And over here, though, at higher temperatures, the bonds that are formed stay put, and they are stable, and they do not revert to the SiOH bonds, and hence you have a case where both the interfaces are actually strengthened remarkably. So what does that do? Well, we actually did some uh, theoretical calculations wherein you take a single molecule and stretch it, and um, what you find is the energy required to break the, uh, or to, uh, or to uh, stretch and break the a molecule, in the case of where you have just a hydrogen bond is shown over here. And once I add a SiO-Si bond, then actually you're nearly doubling, uh, you know, increasing by a factor of 2.5. And um, that actually corresponds very well to the experimental measurement that I showed you. Well, I hope I have uh, uh, touched upon a few of the topics that, is, uh, that are relevant to making to realizing nanoelectronics devices, okay, wherein you use uh, nanostructures where quantum confinement effects predominate, right? Uh, I have ignored a complete field here uh, in my talk, uh, where you know I talk, uh, where people grow these um, uh, semiconductor nanostructures, quantum dots by MBE and other means. And um, um, this one, of course, is an alternative approach and perhaps much more rewarding, um, much more, uh, well, I, I would say it has much higher potential rewards if you can do this because you can make these structures, you can tailor them at the atomic scale, and then you can actually also assemble them uh, by using bottom-up uh, strategies uh, by uh, harnessing chemistry and nature and, of course, putting it with top-down approaches. So thank you very much for your attention, and I'd be very happy to answer any questions that you may have. The experiment on the nanotube properties changing by ion irradiation was very interesting. May I know how does these properties change? Is it dependent on the fluence of ion, or the charge in the ion, or the nature of the ion? You've chosen gallium or some other. 
Okay. Uh, the answer to the question is all those actually. I didn't uh, go uh, into details, but we have discussed this in the papers. Um, fluence is important. Uh, actually, the combination of fluence and energy is very important. Okay. And generally, the higher the energy, the the lower the f well. In, in the energy range that we have looked at, the higher the energy, uh, the lower the fluence that uh, the nanotube can take. The diameter of the nanotube is important. Of course, the uh, species that you use is very important, you know, argon versus gallium, because of just because of the different uh, masses and different cross sections of interactions um, when they uh, uh, when you are hitting them, hitting the carbon atoms. You have touched KEV ranges, or, yes. and we can go to MEVs and. Okay. You could, but you know, if you go to, uh, if you go to MAVs, I think the interactions would be much smaller because of uh, you know the cross sections actually rapidly fall off. Um, I think the most attractive uh, range is perhaps uh, just a few keV. Um, there have been a lot of computer simulations uh, for the lower ranges um, uh, for a few hundred eV, and also recently for keVs. And you know, there are a lot of uh, lot of things that you can do in that range to modify controllably. Thank you. Uh, you mentioned uh, the interaction of proteins with carbon nanotubes. I just wanted to know the primary motivation for that and have you studied optical properties of uh, the NDs? Have I studied what? Optical properties. Of the nanotubes? Yes. Okay, I haven't studied the optical properties of nanotubes, that is easy. Now the proteins, are motivation uh, for, I mean others have done the protein carbon nanotube hybrids also, um, but there it was non-specific or not site selective. Uh, we wanted to look at, uh, I mean, our idea was if you want to make a device, okay, and uh, our idea of a device is to have multiple elements, okay, like a chip as opposed to a single nanotube device. And in order to manufacture that, how do you do that? You need to be able to, you know, precisely position different kinds of proteins at different places. How would you do that? So that's, uh, so we, wa we uh, wanted to look at uh, nanoparticles and biological systems for you know, obviously different applications. And the protein that we looked at obviously was was thought of, uh, of uh, we thought of it for um, computing, okay, I mean bio-inspired computing or switching, whatever you call it, and also for sensing and recognition. Actually, I'm a biologist and you are using biological molecules in this, uh, making the chips. I have a very small apprehension about that you are taking sulfur and proteins and all this. Many of the microbes develop in it. I don't know, in your experimental design you take care of the microbe growing on these surfaces in natural conditions. Uh, in our case, no, we didn't take care of it. In fact, this is uh, our, our forays into using the proteins, uh, um, uh, you know, as hybrid structures with carbon nanotubes was just restricted to that, to making it and exploring to see if there is any uh, responses that we can get because of the dipole moments. Uh, so if there is any effects of you know, microbes and so forth, it is uh, not evident, at least from our experiment, but I'm sure that will be evident, you know, I mean, that will be an important factor to consider. Said that uh, after annealing and before annealing, there is change in coercivity. And if you, do, if you are doing the coercivity, annealing at say 500 or 400 degrees Celsius, I think, um, what should be the medium at the time of annealing, um, whether it is in open atmosphere or in argon atmosphere or it should be in our atmosphere? Okay. There are chances that since the thick um, carbon atoms are very, uh, in, you can say, in a naked position, the carbon atom. So there may be chances of oxidation or not, okay. or they are very. Okay, in the case of iron platinum, is yes. the so question what should the environment right. Right. at the time of annealing at this temperature? Uh, we have done it in uh, various different environments and the one that I showed you are in inert environments. These are in vacuum or in uh, argon and of course the environment matters. Um, I didn't emphasize that but of course we do this, you can do this in air too but uh, you would have uh, uh, oxidation issues. Okay. Ram, I had a question for you. Could you uh, care to comment on the status of uh, predictive tools that will tell you how these uh, different nanotubes, for example, might grow in certain configurations. Because the next step before you get into devices, and in order to design those devices, you need to have a certain level of predictive capability to say how, how would you control the, uh, 
uh, the temperatures and so on and so forth to grow the right device? Actually, that's an excellent question. Um, and in fact, this is an area, I was thinking about this last night when I was going through my talk for carbon nanotubes. You know, carbon nanotubes are 16 years old now in terms since their discovery, at least since their formal discovery. Um, and nobody really knows how they grow and why they grow. And there is um, there are a lot of guesses. Um, of course, there is a, some correlation in terms of what kind of materials catalyze them. And there are theories about uh, uh, you know the structural inheritance of the carbon nano, uh, the, the graphene shell mm -hmm. from certain planar facets of certain you know uh, 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 catalysts. And also, it's very interesting that almost all catalysts of carb for carbon nanotube growth are magnetic. Okay, so in this perhaps an area where uh, this the soft computing tools can be used to, you know, like uh, at least open up areas, mm -hmm. or where, where you know, which can be further explored experimentally. Uh, I think the opportunity is really huge, right. um, uh, and in fact, the timing for that is perhaps uh, good right now because you know, the the excitement in carbon nanotubes and uh, particularly nanotubes and of course other fields has been, you know, make new things and you know, see what's going on, and it's been. It, it, produced a lot of excitement and uh, now I think uh, time is ripe to really understand and comprehend and reflect mm -hmm. you know about how it's happening to really get control and uh, without getting that kind of control I think at least I believe that uh, uh, that control is critical to be able to go to the stage of uh, making a device in manufacturing. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Thanks. Uh, there's one other comment.